Uh, I appreciate many of you have come here to hear Larry Sanders talk about the NHS and talk about the US election, so I'm going to give a brief introduction, talk through a few things about the NHS and how things are currently, whether we plenty of time to hear Larry talk about everything from healthcare to the US elections and plenty of time to take questions after as well. So firstly, thanks for coming. I apologise in advance if I'm slightly tired, but I've recently just come off several night shifts at Addenbrooke's Hospital uh, and I'm feeling a little bit tired. So I'm going to count it as a success if I can get through the next hour without mispronouncing Jeremy Hunt's name, to be honest. <laughs> uh, as Oscar said, my name is Stuart Tuckard. I'm a NHS charge nurse at Addenbrooke's Hospital. I've been here for a couple of years and I'm also an activist for the Cambridge Green Party as well. Uh, we've run this event because, we're, because partly we've got Larry here to help us talk about NHS reforms, but because we think it's really, really important to talk to people about what is happening with the National Health Service in the United Kingdom at the moment. I'm very proud to work for the National Health Service. I think it's an organisation that we should all cherish and that we should all fight to protect. Um, uh, I've always wanted to work in the NHS since I was a student nurse and I uh, couldn't really dream of working anywhere else to be honest. I think it's something we should be incredibly proud of that we've got a system that provides first class treatment to anybody who needs it regardless of their ability to pay or of their status in society and uh, that's something that's very important to protect. The NHS was years ahead of its time in terms of being established and providing a universal, comprehensive public health service free at the point of care to anyone who needed it. And uh, when the NHS gets it right, it really does get it right. It's one of the best healthcare systems in the world at times. I think of some of the people that I've seen and some of the people I've treated in the last couple of years. Uh, just thinking about this before preparing my little talk, I thought about a young 19-year-old lad who was involved in a major car accident uh, near Cambridge who I treated, who. Uh, had you know, massive injuries, needed something like 90 units of blood to survive, was worked on for months and months by surgeons and, and by you know, healthcare professionals in the NHS, but then six or seven months later on managed to walk out with his family and go home to a normal life. And uh, you know, when you see the NHS get it like that, you really appreciate how important it is. I saw another lady, a young mother, who was also involved in major trauma, who had significant brain damage and really extensive injuries, and watched her recover over three, four months and go on to see her the first time she brought her children in to see her after this major accident and seeing the kind of way her face lit up and you know um, how important it was to her after surviving everything she went through made you realise just how important it is. But also we need to really talk about how poor things can be in the NHS at times and how what is being done to the NHS at the moment leads to really examples of poor care and to things getting missed that shouldn't do. And uh, it's really important that we acknowledge that we don't just talk about cutbacks and deficits but we talk about the way that people suffer as a result of the cutbacks that are being made to the NHS. And what is happening to the NHS at the moment? I think it's very clear to say, and it's very important to say, that we believe the NHS is being deliberately undermined by the government we have in this country. The NHS is overwhelmingly popular. Something like 90% of the UK population support the idea of a general, universal healthcare system funded through general taxation and free point of care. And there's never been a political or democratic mandate from the British public to begin the dismantling of the NHS, to sell the services, or to make cutbacks in the way that they are doing at the moment. <coughs> The uh, privatisation of the NHS, the deficit and the cutbacks began you know, a number of years ago now, it's not something new. Uh, the Labour government in, of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown introduced foundation hospitals back in the mid 2000s. These changes were opposed by large healthcare unions because they created autonomous kind of healthcare bodies and new hospital systems that, were, that healthcare unions believed would create a two tier system within the NHS. But regardless of the changes then, when we arrived in 2010 we had an NHS that was still performing well, that was projecting surpluses around the country and it was generally meeting its waiting times targets and its referral to treatment times targets as well. The government that we elected in 2010, the Conservative and Lib Dem government, uh, the Conservative pledged in their manifesto and went, I quote, no top-down reorganisations of the NHS. Yet, despite that, in 2012, the Tory government led by, um, and the reforms led by Andrew Lansley, a local MP here, ex-local MP, re, uh, put in place the biggest reorganisation that the NHS has ever seen. Some of the fundamental things that it put in place were that it broke the link between the government and the Secretary of State's for Health duty to provide a universal comprehensive healthcare service. It began to allow NHS trusts to make up to 50% of their income from private patients. And it allowed private companies into the National Health Service in a big new way that they never had been able to do before. We warned at the time, um, that one of the main reasons behind introducing the reforms was that they said that it would allow GPs to commission local healthcare services for people who knew, you know, GPs who knew their local areas the best and would be able to provide the services that people needed. But GPs overwhelmingly opposed the plans and didn't believe they were the best place people to be able to commission healthcare services for local regions. We warned in, our, in the healthcare unions and uh, the Royal College of Physicians, of Surgeons, of GPs, 
all warned that the reforms would cause, would cause financial chaos, a deterioration in the quality of care, and possibly rationing of care in the future. And now we're being told that the NHS needs to deliver £22 billion of efficiency savings by 2021. But I think it's important we have a fundamental discussion about why allowing private companies into the healthcare service is necessarily a bad thing in the first place. Because I think most British people, in, in, uh, if you were to speak to them, would agree that as long as the quality of care was being provided was good, that they wouldn't object necessarily to being provided by someone else. But there's a number of reasons why allowing private companies into the NHS in such a big way leads to many problems. And I'm sure Larry will talk about the way private companies can profiteer in the US healthcare service. The government likes to talk about private companies being efficient and being more effective than run, at running things than the public service. But uh, what we've got in the NHS now because of the expansion of private companies is the opposite of efficiency. NHS services, uh, the internal market in the NHS, the way services are contracted and negotiated, costs the service between four and a half billion and ten billion pounds a year, a huge amount of money spent on management consultants, on financiers, on lawyers that should all be going on frontline care to provide quality care to patients. One of the fundamental problems is that the profits that healthcare companies make are not reinvested in frontline services. When the NHS makes a surplus, it's reinvested in services to make them better for people. But when companies like Virgin Care, who are their subsidiary companies based in the British Virgin Islands, make millions of pounds on NHS contracts, that money disappears to offshore tax havens and doesn't get reinvested in the NHS. This is Virgin Healthcare, which recently won a £700 million contract to run services in Bath and Somerset. Private companies also like to cherry pick the best parts of the NHS to provide the services that are most profitable to them, leaving the NHS organisations to pick up the services that are unglamorous and more unaffordable, creating a two-tier system across the country that means you get a dramatic difference in the quality of care between the different places. We estimate the cost spent on management consultants in the NHS every year is about £640 million as well. So I think it's really important that we constantly point out that when they talk about the NHS making efficiency savings, they remember the huge amount of money that's wasted on, this, on financiers, on consultants, and that doesn't go on direct patient care. And we've also got the added cost to the public service, to the public sector and ta to taxpayers of stepping in to rescue private companies and private services when they deteriorate. Cambridgeshire and Peterborough has been one of the regions that suffered most badly because of this. We had uh, the first private healthcare company to run an NHS hospital in the UK, Hinchingbrook Hospital, where the standard of care deteriorated badly to the point of being rated inadequate by the inspectors. And they had to ask the government for 10 million pound bailout of their services. Uh, local Cambridgeshire and Peterborough health bosses also launched a way of combining to uh, provide older people's and community services that was worth around £800 million as well. And despite that, the service collapsed within six months and uh, forced uh, the local commissioning groups, the local health authorities, to take on board a huge amount of debt as a result of it as well. And it's very, very important that we recognise that some of the companies that we're trusting with the care of our relatives and our loved ones are companies that have already got a really bad track record of ripping off the government and of providing very, very poor service when it comes to running other public services. Um, Circle, uh, we've already talked about their performance at Hinchingbrook, and recently a massive contract was awarded to a multinational giant called Capita to provide services to GPs, which have already deteriorated badly, and which has been described as an absolute shambles. So it begs the question, with all of this, of why the government's allowing this to happen if the results are so bad. And I think the first thing to acknowledge is that many of the people that are running the government and are running the health service now don't fundamentally believe in the ability or the necessity of government running public services. Jeremy Hunt, Jeremy Hunt, our current Secretary of State, uh, co-authored a book in the mid-2000s calling for NHS privatisation. And a man called Oliver Letwin, one of the policy chiefs in the Conservative Party, also wrote uh, pamphlets and policies in the mid-2000s and earlier calling for NHS privatisation. The man we've appointed as chief of the NHS, uh, chief of the NHS, the man the government has appointed, Simon Stevens was also involved in lobbying for healthcare companies and private health in the US for, over, for nearly a decade. And we should also point out that many of the major donors and supporters of the government are people that, and companies that profit hugely out of the internal market created in the NHS. Some of the big four accountancy firms like Dell Watt, PwC, KPMG are accountancy firms with much expertise in drafting legislation. They often take part in, in, in uh, offering the expertise in providing reform and um, launching legislation and then go on to make millions and millions out of the reforms that they've created. And there's also the fact that many government ministers and politicians follow that revolving door between public service and the private sector after the Leave government. Uh, new Labour health ministers such as Patricia Hewitt or Alan Milburn both led healthcare reforms in the NHS and went on to make a lot of money from jobs with health companies advising on the reforms that they'd created. 
and many people who leave the reforms are rewarded for, uh, despite the fact that their reforms have become a complete shambles. Andrew Lansley, despite leading the NHS reforms of 2012 that have been such a disaster, uh, is now been rewarded as he's become a baron and a knight of the realm as well. So people have got really used to talking about the crisis in the NHS and the looming crisis, and I think people have kind of got a little bit too comfortable with the idea, but we really do seem to be at a crisis point now, almost a breaking point in the NHS, and I think it's important to reiterate where we, where we do stand now. NHS trusts around the country face around an annual deficit of £2.5 billion. Pounds. We've got ambulance services around the country that aren't able to reach patients in, in the time they need to treat critically unwell people. It was released today by the BBC that only one in 13 ambulance trusts in England are able to meet their target for getting to critically unwell patients on time. The NHS started this year with its worst ever set of performance targets. Um, social care in the community is an important factor as well and something we often don't talk about. But um, the ability of social care to look after people and to keep them well and to prevent them going into acute hospital beds is very, very important. But the CQC, the inspectors of social care and hospital services, now say that those services are at complete tipping point. And again, I think it's important that we don't just talk about the numbers and the deficits and the cuts, but about the effects on actual people in the communities. I've got here a very good report by a campaign organisation called the Cambridge Commons, which looks at health inequalities in Cambridge and the effects of cutbacks. And they've gone through the cutbacks to local authority budgets in Cambridgeshire in very close detail. It leads to things like people having their incontinence pads changed less, less often, people getting less and less social contact, or even vulnerable young children not getting the support they need to protect them from, abu uh, from abuse or exploitation. We, we see that mental health services, something that are hugely important and something that are talked about, are becoming increasingly stretched. Um, our man here, Anthony Carpen, who's covering this event for us, luckily earlier on tweeted that what was it, Anthony, something like another 12 NHS beds for mental health in the region have been cut back, which means that people are being forced to travel up to 177 miles to access emergency services for mental health. And this is a real, real growing problem and something we need to address, and we need to have more services, not less. Just earlier on this today, me and Larry met with some junior doctors who took part in the strikes earlier this year. Um, the junior doctor we met, we talked about how demoralised and how angry all the junior doctors who work in the NHS are at the moment. It's incredible that we've got this energetic, you know, um, talented group of young people who are doing their best to care for people, but are being forced by the government to take strike action because they, be, because they believe that the contracts being forced upon them are unfair and unsafe. The uh, junior doctor we met this afternoon said that out of 24 people she graduated with now, only 11 of those are left working in the NHS, and she believes that many, many more are looking to go abroad and work because of the conditions they're facing in the NHS. Uh, the staff who work for the NHS are increasingly stressed out, um, the amount of sick time taken by nurses due to stress has risen by something like 30% in the last couple of years. And uh, the government's also taken on the fight to student nurses to remove the bursary that's provided to them in their training. Uh, I relied on that student bursary to, when I did my training to become a nurse. And I know that many people later on in life who want to become nurses really, really need that support to be able to afford the training. Now they're going to be, able to, now they're going to be forced to pay tuition fees at the same time as providing patient care in NHS hospitals and then when they come out the other end, face huge student bills, which uh, they'll be able to, unable to really pay off in the short term because of their low wages. We also rely massively on EU nurses and on foreign nurses to staff our National Health Service. And given Brexit and given the current political situation, many EU nurses are, are choosing not to come to Britain to work here anymore. And I imagine many of the nurses that I work with are probably thinking about the security of their career and maybe returning to their home countries to nurse in the future. So yeah, I think given all of that, it's fair to say that the NHS is facing a bit of a crisis at the moment. And what the government plans to do about it is they've forced 44 regions around the United Kingdom to come up with what they call sustainability and transformation plans. And sorry if I, you say something like that and people just switch off immediately because it's so boring and so confusing. But basically what these plans are, are the, the way that the different regions around the UK are going to come up with their share of the £22 billion pounds worth of efficiency savings they need to make on top of the savings that have already been made. In Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, that means that the NHS services we've talked about already, that are already under huge pressure, are need, going to need to deliver £547 million pounds of annual savings by 2021, which we can all agree, I think, is completely unachievable without delivering rationing in care or without deteriorations in the quality of care. Um, these reforms will deliver whole new transformations to the way NHS organisations provide care and the way that healthcare is provided in the community. Um, and the fundamental thing about this is that you cannot provide transformation, you cannot provide improvements in the quality of care at the same time as you're trying to deal with the huge problems that we've got now that require urgent investment. So we should be saying to the government, 
yes, we want to, as Larry said on the radio earlier on today in Cambridge, we want to have discussions about how to improve the NHS and how to deliver better quality care, but we can't do that at the same time as the NHS organisations are struggling to stay afloat at all. So I don't want to depress everyone too much. I'd like to have a little time to talk about what it is we can do to improve the situation and what we can do to try and rescue the NHS before it's too late. In my job, which is uh, working with deteriorating patients and working with people who are clinically unwell, we're taught to use an A, B, C, D, E approach to always approach these things in a logical kind of consequence and see what we can do about them. So this might sound a little bit contrived, but that's why I looked at this current situation and tried to come up with a way of how we could deal with the situation we're facing. And I think that A should stand for argue. We should, be st we should be arguing with the local authorities and with NHS health bosses to stop these sustainability and transformation plans before it's too late. We've been warned that all the financial assumptions that they're making in these plans uh, do not stand up to serious scrutiny and they're going to lead to massive disasters in the way that care is provided unless we pause and unless we have a proper think about delivering them in the proper way. So to start with, we need to argue with them to stop those plans. And we were along at the County Council Hall in Cambridge earlier today delivering letters to county councillors asking them to prevent those plans going any further before they've been discussed with local people properly. B, we need to bring back the NHS properly. It's not merely enough to talk about increasing funding or in stopping plans going forward. We need to fundamentally overturn the NHS Health and Social Care Act of 2012 and back a proper reinstatement of the NHS. Uh, Dr Alison Pollock, who's an NHS health campaigner along with the British Medical Association, backed something called the NHS Reinstatement Bill, which is going to Parliament again soon which would overturn the Health and Social Care Act of 2012 and properly reinstate the government's duty to provide a universal, comprehensive healthcare service. It was brought to Parliament last year by the Green MP Caroline Lucas, but was argued out and filibustered by a number of Tory MPs who didn't allow it to be properly debated. We need everyone to back that bill to, to say that it's not enough merely to, to stand still, but we need to bring back the NHS properly and we need people to put pressure on their local MPs to go and support that bill when it comes back to Parliament this year, backed by a Labour MP to bring back the NHS properly. C, we need to properly campaign to protect our services in the short term. There's some fantastic campaigns, campaigns out there warning people about what's happening to the NHS and asking them to get involved from Keep Our NHS Public to 999 Call for the NHS to the People's March for the NHS, some of whom we met this afternoon. They're doing some really good work and we know that the public's with us on this. They don't agree with NHS privatisation and they don't agree with cutbacks. So I'd urge everyone to look up those campaigns and get involved and see what they can do. And D, in the short term, we need to demand proper investment. Larry was mentioning on the radio earlier on that the NHS has one of the lowest investments in healthcare per head of GDP of almost any Western country. We spend significantly less on the NHS than, than, than Germany, than France, Italy, Portugal, Spain. And so it's not merely a case of throwing bad money after good. We just need to properly invest to provide the type of healthcare that we, that we need and to relieve the pressure on the acute services and social care that exist at the moment. And the final E, and this is the one I like the most, is to evict. We need to <laughs> properly throw out every single politician who's lied to us about what's happening about the NHS and who continues to press ahead with these plans. Some of the local campaign groups are doing fantastic work to scrutinise these plans to try and stop what's happening, but at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to protect the NHS unless we throw out the politicians that are responsible for destroying it. So thank you all for listening, and that's my ABCD approach for hopefully rescuing the NHS. Thank you.